Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by, and welcome to the NanoString Third Quarter 2020 Operating Results Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. Please note this call is being recorded. If you require any further assistance, please press star 0. I will now hand the conference over to Mr. Doug Farrell, Vice President of Investor Relations. Thank you. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you, operator, and thanks for joining us today. On the call today is Brad Gray, our President and CEO, as well as Tom Bailey, our CFO. Earlier today, we released our financial results for the third quarter of fiscal year 2020. During this call, we may make statements that are forward-looking, including statements about financial projections, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, existing and future collaborations, future business growth, trends, and related factors, prospects for expanding and penetrating our addressable markets, our strategic focus and objectives, and the development status and anticipated success of recent and planned product offerings. Forward-looking statements are subject to risks and uncertainties, many of which are beyond our control, including the risks and uncertainties described in our SEC filings. Our results may differ materially from those projected, and we undertake no obligation to update these forward-looking statements. Later in this call, Tom will be reviewing our financial results. Consistent with our most recent earnings release, we have prepared as a supplement to our results according to GAAP, selected non-GAAP or adjusted measures that we believe make it easier to interpret and compare our financial results. This afternoon's press release includes details regarding the definition and calculation of these non-GAAP measures, reconciliation of non-GAAP measures to the nearest comparable GAAP measure, as well as a discussion of the limitations rationale for using these measures. Throughout this call, all financial measures will be GAAP unless otherwise noted. To aid analysts and investors in building their models, we have posted exhibits under the Financial Information tab of our Investor Relations homepage that include a presentation of our non-GAAP or adjusted measures and other selected financial data for each quarter and for the full year 2019. Uh, later this month, we'll be participating in two virtual healthcare conferences, uh, the Steeple Healthcare Conference and Credit Suisse. In addition, as you may have seen in our press release today, we're excited to announce our virtual Investor Day event, which will be held Tuesday, December 1st, uh, where we'll provide updates as to the product roadmap, commercial initiatives, and the development of the spatial biology market. We look forward to having a chance to speak with many of you there. Uh, with that, let me turn the call over to Brad. Thanks, Doug. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. Nanostring is a leader in spatial biology, and we are addressing a large and growing market with huge potential across discovery, translation, and clinical diagnostics. We have tremendous momentum as evidenced by the strong orders for our genomics DSP instruments, increasing demand for genomics consumables, and our rapidly expanding funnel of sales opportunities. During the third quarter, we generated over 20% pro forma revenue growth, despite ongoing pandemic-related headwinds. We pre-announced these third quarter results on October 6th and successfully completed a $230 million equity financing that gives us the resources to fund our current growth initiatives, as well as to make future investments to help extend our leadership in spatial genomics. We have never been in a stronger position or more excited about our growth prospects. During the call today, I'll give you more specifics on our Q3 operational results and update you on progress towards our strategic objectives for the year. I'll then hand off to Tom, who will review the details of our financial results an outlook for the balance of 2020. During the third quarter, we maintained our commercial momentum in spatial genomics, generating new orders for more than 25 genomics instruments, exceeding the guidance we provided during our August call. The leading indicators of future genomics demand were positive across the board, including a doubling in the volume of TAP projects over the prior year, a steady stream of genomics publications, and a torrid pace of lead generation through virtual conferences and events. At the end of Q3, we had more than 150 cumulative geomics orders, with more than 120 instruments shipped, about 100 installed, and about 90 geomics sites trained. The rates of geomics instrument shipment, installations, and training all improved in Q3, 
as labs increase research activity levels compared to the second quarter. <clears throat> We're seeing genomics consumable utilization ramp up as we install systems and train sites, and we recorded $1.4 million in genomics consumable sales in Q3, more than double the prior quarter. Our core encounter business has been recovering nicely from pan the pandemic-driven slowdown, growing sequentially by more than 50% compared to Q2. Encounter revenue was down less than 5% on a pro forma basis compared to the prior year versus the roughly 30% year-on-year dip we experienced during the second quarter. Encounter demand improved as research activity increased over the lows of Q2. Our sales team estimates that globally, about 25% of our customer labs are fully open, while the remaining 75% are operating at reduced capacity. Laboratories have not increased their activity levels meaningly, meaningfully since August, and we expect most labs to continue operating at reduced capacity through the end of the year. We have not seen rising COVID-19 infection rates in the U.S. and Europe lead to a slowdown in research activities, but we are monitoring the situation closely and factoring that dynamic into a cautious Q4 outlook. Now I'd like to provide an update on our four strategic objectives that we laid out at the beginning of the year. Our first strategic objective is to accelerate the adoption of genomics DSP and translational research, where Encounter is the preferred readout modality. Our lead in translational research remains large and accounts for the vast majority of the 150 plus genomics DSP orders we've taken through September 30th. More than 15 of our 25 plus genomics DSP system orders in Q3 were from translational researchers planning to use the encounter based readout. Encounter based readout is well suited to the needs of researchers who are focused on running targeted protein panels, offering a simple workflow and low cost per sample. We recently expanded our market leading menu content, launching three new protein modules for readout using Encounter. This brings the total portfolio of genomics protein assays to over 300 validated antibodies. We continue to see strong demand for genomics encounter bundles, demonstrating that we are penetrating the translational market beyond our historic install base of encounter systems. Our translational customers continue to publish at an impressive rate, and since our August call, there have been six new genomics papers for a total of 29 cumulative genomics publications. The body of peer-reviewed genomics data is growing on a pace similar to the early days of single-cell genomics, and we believe this is helping fuel demand. In September, we announced the formation of the Genomics Translational Leadership Network that is focused on pioneering the application of spatial biology in large translational research studies, developing and sharing standardized practices to facilitate collaboration between groups of researchers across the globe. Next week, We'll be participating in the Association for Molecular Pathology Conference, where we are hosting a workshop focused on the diagnostic potential of genomics. While the clinical market is not expected to make a meaningful revenue contribution over the next year, it does provide an exciting long-term growth opportunity for spatial biology, and we believe will arise naturally out of our success in translational research. Our second strategic objective is to expand the adoption of genomics into discovery research, leveraging the platform's next-generation sequencing readout capabilities. Interest in genomics amongst discovery researchers is being driven by the unique capabilities of the system, which include full automation, compatibility with formal and fixed paraffin embedded samples, and the ability to profile both RNA and proteins using the massive install base of next-generation sequencers. In August, we launched the first NGS-based consumables for genomics DSP, the Cancer Transcriptome Atlas, or CTA, which profiles more than 1,800 RNAs in spatial context. In the third quarter, about 10 of our genomics DSP orders came from researchers who plan to make NGS their primary readout for genomics. As discovery researcher interest in NGS has increased, we are expanding opportunities for prospective customers to test drive genomics using their own samples, beginning with our technology access program, or TAP. During the third quarter, more than half of the record 75 plus TAP projects ordered used NGS as the readout. 
In September, we expanded our TAP program to include our whole transcriptome assay, or WTA, which is helping to build commercial demand and momentum ahead of WTA's commercial launch next year. This assay allows researchers to profile every gene in the human transcriptome in an unbiased manner, providing a powerful discovery tool that can be used to probe any aspect of spatial biology in human tissue. To complement our internal tab, we formed an external service network called the Geomics Premier Access Sites, consisting of eight laboratories around the world that will provide customers with easy access to run their own samples, allowing them to use that data to write grants and budget requests to purchase their own geomic system. Finally, as we announced this morning, we have expanded our NGS readout capabilities to include our industry-leading portfolio of protein panels. Customers using our cancer transcriptome atlas will now be able to add complementary protein content, including more than 50 protein targets that are focused on immuno-oncology applications. With the addition of protein capability to our RNA offerings, the ability to analyze markers in virtually any tissue type, we now offer the most versatile and diverse portfolio of content for discovery research in the emerging field of spatial biology. Our third strategic objective is to maintain the momentum of our encounter business by expanding our installed base while maintaining consumable pull through. In the third quarter, we generated healthy instrument demand and grew our installed base to approximately 915 encounter systems, an increase of 12% compared to a year ago. While about 20% of our encounter instrument sales were driven by genomics bundles, the majority of placements were motivated by traditional gene expression in the field of oncology, immunology, and neuroscience. Immunology is an area of, area of particularly strong interest driven in part by new encounter panels. For example, we're seeing strong interest in our new host response panel that allows scientists to study the immune system response to SARS-CoV-2 or any other pathogen. This panel can be used in combination with our COVID-19 gene spike in, which has been ordered by more than 75 customers to date. Encounter gene expression studies of COVID-19 now have been published in both New England Journal of Medicine and in Science, reaffirming the unique position of Encounter to generate key translational results on hard-to-analyze FFPE samples. Our fourth strategic objective for 2020 is to select the key applications for our HiveNSeq platform. As we mentioned in August, our team has been exploring potential applications for this unique sequencing chemistry. While for the time being, these remain confidential. We plan to provide an update on the direction of this program and our overall product development pipeline at the Virtual Investor Day that we'll be hosting on Tuesday, December 1st. Doug will provide details shortly after the call. Now I'd like to turn the call over to Tom to review the details of our operating results for the third quarter. Thanks, Brad, and thanks all for joining us today. I'm excited to walk through our results from this quarter, which are strong top to bottom, despite a challenging operating environment. For the third quarter of 2020, product and service revenue is 30.1 million, representing pro forma year-over-year -year growth of 22% and sequential growth of 42%. Recall that our pro forma measures reflect the December 2019 transaction with Verisite, as if that transaction occurred at the beginning of the comparative periods. Pursuant to the terms of the Verisite transaction, we now recognize about one-third of the previous per Cigna revenue over the same units sold. As Brad noted, geomics demand was strong in Q3. Geomics revenue recognized was 8.9 million. 7.5 million was derived from approximately 30 instruments shipped and 1.4 million was derived from consumable sales. Encounter instrument revenue was 5.4 million, about 8% lower compared to Q3 19, but showing a strong recovery with the sequential growth of about 50% as compared to Q2. Encounter consumables revenue has been more impacted by lower lab activity. However, in Q3, we began seeing substantive recovery. Q3 Encounter, Encounter consumables revenue was 12.3 million, 9% lower on a pro forma basis compared to Q3 19, but sequential growth of 55% compared to Q2. Our Q3 Encounter, Encounter consumable sales imply annualized pull through 
was about $55,000 per system, about 90% of our pre-pandemic pull-through guidance and a substantial improvement over the $37,000 annualized pull-through we experienced during Q2. Service revenue derived from both Encounter and Geomix-related services was about $3.6 million for the quarter, 16% year-over-year growth and 20% sequential growth, driven primarily by increasing Geomix DSP TAP projects and increased service contract revenue due to our growing instrument installed basis. Turning now to margins and expenses, I'll be providing results on a non-GAAP or adjusted basis, which remove the impact of stock-based compensation depreciation and certain one-time items. Please refer to our press release as well as the exhibits we have posted to our investor relations webpage for detailed information on how our non-GAAP or adjusted measures, including adjusted EBITDA, are prepared. Q3 adjusted gross margin on product and service revenue was 55%, about 600 basis points lower than Q3 last year. About half of that change was driven by the lower prosigna pricing we received for the Verisite transaction. Pro forma for the Verisite transaction, adjusted gross margin was about 300 basis points lower, primarily due to greater instrument revenue as a percentage of our total sales mix with the acceleration of geomix sales. We reduced operating expenses compared to the quarter a year ago. Adjusted R&D expense was 12.7 million, a decrease of 16% year over year. The decrease was was driven primarily by reductions related to the Verisite transaction and the conclusion of certain collaboration agreements, offset in part by expenses incurred for our continued geomics product development efforts. Adjusted SG&A expense was $16.6 million, a decrease of 16% year over year. The Q3 SG&A expense decline was driven primarily by reductions relating to the Verisite transaction, as well as expense savings realized from reductions in travel and trade show activities. These savings were partially offset by our continued investment in geomics-related commercial initiatives, in particular investments made in our service and customer support group and in certain digital marketing initiatives. Adjusted EBITDA loss was $12.7 million, an improvement of 33% as compared to the prior year and reflecting the combined impact of our revenue growth and lower operating expenses. Turning to the balance sheet, We are pleased to have the strongest balance sheet in Nanostrings history after completion of a common stock offering last month, which we upsized due to strong investor demand. The offering generated net proceeds of about 216 million, including these proceeds and cash and equivalents on hand at the end of Q3. Our cash, cash equivalents and short-term investments balance is currently over 445 million. Transitioning to guidance, for Q4, we currently expect product and service revenue of about 31 to 34 million, which assumes lab activity levels that are approximately consistent with Q3. This range assumes 21 to 23 million of encounter revenue and 10 to 11 million dollars of geomics revenue. Our encounter guidance represents just over 3% sequential growth from Q3 at the midpoint of the range, consistent with last year's Q3 to Q4 encounter sequential growth. Our Q4 guidance range is wider than we typically provide, reflecting current pandemic-related recent uncertainty with infection rates setting new records in North America and new lockdowns in EMEA. While our sales funnel remains strong and October purchasing activity remained at levels similar to those observed in Q3, we are aware of a few specific examples of purchasing processes slowing down in Europe in recent weeks. As has been true throughout the pandemic, Revenue in Q4 may be negatively impacted if customers are unable to place orders or receive shipments due to site closures. Geomics revenue recognized might also be impacted by the pace of our service and support team's ability to install systems and train customers, which is dictated by our own safety and operational procedures, as well as those of our customers. Against this backdrop, we are guiding for 25 plus new Geomics instrument orders during Q4, approximately flat to our strong Q3. Regarding expenses, we expect gross margins and operating expenses to be about consistent with what we recorded in Q3. Now I'll turn the call back over to Brad for our closing comments. Thanks, Tom. Nanostring is an early leader in spatial biology, a rapidly developing field that will revolutionize biology. We've generated tremendous momentum with our initial geomics offerings among translational researchers. And we are now leveraging NGS readout to rapidly expand the capabilities of this platform 
to appeal to an even broader uh, set of researchers. Following our recent financing, we believe we have the capital needed to both grow to sustainability and to invest in strategic growth opportunities. We look forward to our upcoming investor day when we will share additional details on how we plan to put this capital to work organically within our innovative pipeline, helping to further extend our leadership in spatial biology. With that, I'd like to open up the line for your questions. And at this time, if you would like to ask a question, press star followed by the number one on your telephone keypad, and that's star followed by the number one. And our first question comes from Dan Arias with Stiefel. Happy you guys. Thanks for the questions. Brad, can you just kind of expand on the comment that Tom made a few minutes ago just in terms of lab access for installation and for training on your instruments? We've we've kind of gotten some varying comments from the different academically focused companies. So I'm just curious what your experience is shaping up like if you look at U.S. versus Europe and the ability to get in there and, and kind of set people up. Thanks for the question, Dan. It's a very dynamic situation. Um, I'd say uh, beginning uh, in the last few weeks, especially as infection rates increased in Europe, we started to see some travel restrictions and complications begin to reemerge in Europe. You know, the, the, we don't have service and support personnel, for instance, in every single country in Europe. We have people that have to cross borders to do installations and trainings and preventative maintenance type work. So when we have quarantine procedures uh, become mandated in places like Europe, for, for, for nanostring it becomes complicating. Um, it becomes hard to send a service engineer from one country to another and then have to take that person out of the field or for seven or 14 days of the quarantine uh, post the installation. So those are the kinds of complications that we're dealing with. It is largely in Europe at this time. Um, and, um, and, you know, and I, I think, you know, we, we are, you know, our guidance range of uh, 10 to $11 million for geomics basically assumes at the top end of that range that we continue to be able to install our uh, and re recognize revenue for geomics systems in a reasonably undisruptive manner uh, over the next, say, uh, eight weeks. Um, and the low end of that range really implies that uh, things get more complicated and we're not in a position to uh, to recognize revenue quite at the pace that we had hoped. Um, uh, lab activity itself, in terms of utilization of consumables, has not slowed down. Uh, we have not, we, we, you know, oct October activity was consistent with Q3. It remained, uh, it remained uh, stable, um, uh, but we are watching closely our indicators uh, to see if some of the same lockdown procedures that you're beginning to hear about in Europe keep people working from home rather than in the lab and whether that, um, that plays through on consumables. To be clear, we have not seen that to date, but we are cautious as we look at the rising infection rates globally. Yep, okay, very helpful. Um, and then maybe on the end counter side, I imagine a lot of the folks that are doing gene expression work on the instrument um, also have a sequencer. So what are you finding at this point are the factors that have lab, labs running the end counter rather than doing an RNA-seq experiment uh, you know, said another way, where are you winning and where are you seeing people choose other approaches? And then maybe along those lines, on the pull through that you're seeing with the end counter, obviously this year, a bunch of factors playing into the growth equation with Verisite and COVID, but any reason why holding steady with double digit consumables growth wouldn't still be in the picture if we just sort of think about normalized trends or, or the longer period of time? Great. Um, so, you know, an encounter has, uh, has always served uh, the need of a set of researchers who value um, a very simple workflow, a very high level of throughput, and specific content that's tuned to the biology of their interest. So, for instance, cancer is a field where nanostring has always had a distinct capability with encounter based on the FFP compatibility, the ability to process 48 or, you know, if, if you really drive at 96 samples a day and on the basis of our very popular pan cancer panels. We've replicated that success in the fields of immunology and neurology, and really that's where you see most of the encounter uptake. And despite the fact that RNA sequencing has grown uh, less expensive over time, it really hasn't gotten much simpler 
to either use from a workflow perspective or from a data analysis perspective. And our customers really want to have independence from their core lab to be able to run that the encounter system themselves and analyze their data themselves and be highly productive. So that's really why Encounter continues to have demand, uh, you know, on the order of, you know, call it 20 to, depending on the, the pandemic dynamic, it was sort of 20 to 30 uh, new instruments per quarter. Uh, and we see that continuing, uh, that we don't see that slowing down uh, in, the, in the next uh, year or, or two. Um, in terms of the consumable demand that, so, you know, the Encounter business is a razor, razor blade model. Every year we try to place about 120 new systems, ex-pandemic, um, growing our installed base at the low double-digit rates and then translating that into a low double-digit consumable revenue growth. So our, our, I said during our, my prepared remarks, for instance, that our installed base is up 12% year-on-year at constant pull-through. You'd expect that to translate into consumables up about 12% year-on-year. So I think... Uh, you're thinking about the model the right way, Dan. I, I think, you know, there's no reason to believe we're going to see a slowdown in encounter instrument placement. That can drive approximately 10% order of magnitude consumable growth in our model going forward. Okay, appreciate it. Thanks, Brad. Our next question comes from Doug Schinkel with Cowan. Uh, hey, good afternoon, guys, and thank you for um, – taking uh my my question um this this might be uh, this might be kind of a similar question to what dan just asked although i i just my my brain may not be working mathematically quite as uh quickly as dan's is tonight um but i i was i was wondering on end counter consumable pull through you, you rebounded back to levels last seen in q1 and q3 I'm just wondering if you could say a little bit more about pacing by month, whether you think there was any stocking activity, and just given all you talked about in your prepared remarks on just kind of, you know, the changes in lab activity or in certain instances the lack of change in lab activity over the course of the quarter, um, do, do you think that this is kind of the new normal for a while, you know, meaning the, the 55,000 annualized per encounter? Um, do you think that's what we should be modeling moving forward? Yeah, thanks for the question, Doug. You know, the pacing over, let me go all the way back to Q2 to tell you what we saw a little bit about the pacing over the last couple quarters. So you remember in the depths of the COVID-19 lockdown, we saw just abysmal demand and lab activity happening during the months of April and May during Q2. We saw a substantial increase in June and so, um, you know, we, we exited Q2 at a, at a pretty decent run rate of consumables, much better than the average of Q2 overall. Uh, you know, the June run rate was much better than the overall quarterly average. We saw that continue to improve in July and August as, uh, you know, labs moved into uh, really out of, you know, out of a situation where some labs were closed. We have virtually no labs that are totally closed at this stage. Most labs operate in this partially open uh, scenario really since the end of August where maybe the staffing is not quite as high as it normally would be um, uh, in terms of the number of actual people in the lab and therefore the, the amount of research activity is, is not as high as it would be, but it's a lot more than zero. So uh, really since, uh, since the end of August, we haven't seen that change much. We've seen about the same level of lab activity and the same level of, therefore, consumable order pacing. I think this is going to state we're going to be in at least through the end of Q4. Um, you know, labs are figuring out how to get as much work done as possible, spreading people out physically in their labs, spreading people over multiple shifts, maybe into the weekends. But I don't think that we will see uh, us get all the way back to pre pre-pandemic uh, pull through uh, until uh, 2021. So our Q4 guidance, I think a good way to think about it is, you know, applying that $55,000 per system per year consumable pull through on our, on our, you know, modestly larger uh, uh, installed base on a sequential basis. And that's totally consistent with Tom's guidance. Got it. And, and just, just to be real clear on that, and, and that, that was super helpful, Brad, but the, the good thing is, is there was no stocking or catch up dynamic in Q3. So oh. just to, you know, kind no, of with I all really the puts and no. takes. Okay. No, I don't, we don't believe we saw any stocking dynamic. Our, you know, our, uh, our 
consumables are sort of, you know, you got to know what experiment you're going to do before you know what panel to order or what custom code set to order. So we very rarely see stocking dynamics. That was not what was in account for the sharp rebound in Q3. Okay. All right. That That's great. And then um, I, I know we kind of ask some form of this every quarter, um, but you know, recognizing, uh, you know, it seems like it's really, really early days for spatial profiling in the sense that there's a lot of interest, but, you know, you and your competitors are just getting going. Um, so that that's great. You know, I, I do want to ask if you've seen any changes in competitive dynamics uh, amongst the, the competitors that you've noticed, you know, as, as activity has picked up. And then, you know, to the extent there is any change, you know, if you could talk about whether there's, you know, things that you could point to, whether it's application or end market. And then kind of kind of last part of this, you know, is, is the read core 10X combination changing the tone of discussions at all with, with key customers? Yeah, so I'd say in the last quarter, there really has been no material change in competitive dynamics. Uh, you know, Nanostring continues to be incredibly strong where we have been strong with Geomics, which is in the translational markets. We feel very secure in our leadership. We really do not encounter head-to-head -head competition in that market. When we watch at the latest scientific meetings to see if there's any kind of sea change in the representation of Geomics relative to other spatial profiling platforms, we don't see anybody catching up with us. Yeah, for instance, this morning, the Society of Immunotherapy and Cancer Abstracts published. We were glad to see that you know, Geomics appears to have three times as many abstracts as the competition. Um, and uh, you know, we feel really great about our momentum with Geomics showing up in immuno-oncology translational research. So really no change in the competitive dynamic. Um, you know, the, the acquisition by 10X Genomics of ReCore has also, I'd say, not meaningfully changed the dialogue we're having with our customers. You know, that's a product that, you know, we'll, we'll all look forward to seeing what 10X plans to do with it and when it will be coming to market. Um, I think it sits in a category of imaging-based uh, products that I think will be interesting over time that will probably not be commercially impactful for another couple of years. Um, and, uh, and certainly it's not top of mind for the customers right now who are buying Geomics. And when it does become top of mind, I'd say that imaging-based product category is complementary to profiling. Uh, you know, it, the imaging-based category provides high resolution at the single cell or subcellular level. Um, its Plex is going to likely be not quite the whole transcriptome, but hundreds or uh, potentially thousands of genes over time, and it's going to be much lower throughput. It's going to occupy a, a complementary place to where the profilers sit, which tend to be you know, higher throughput, higher plex, all the way up to whole transcriptome and lower resolution. So, um, you know, I say it, it, uh, it remains uh, for us to see how the imaging category develops over time, but right now the, the competitive dynamic is just as it was when we talked to you in August with Nanostring feeling very secure in its leadership and translational, and as, as we talked about in the prepared remarks, a lot of um, movement towards discovery. And then, sorry, last one, Brad, and that was great. Thank you for all that. On, on whole transcriptome atlas, um, and I, I think the plan launched for 2021, I apologize if I missed this in your uh, prepared remarks, but at least in my notes, I have um, in early access in eight global sites. Um, is, is, the, is there any plan to expand this be, before the, um, the full commercial launch next year? So, Doug, if I heard your question properly, you were asking about um, the whole transcriptome atlas uh, availability as a service. So, to be clear, the whole yeah. transcriptome atlas right now is available only through our technology access program. Um, so, you know, and we have a lot of interest in it, people who are uh, sending their samples to us here in Seattle, and we're running the whole transcriptome atlas and um, and shipping results back to them. The the Geomics uh, Priority Site Program is is for people interested in uh, everything but the whole transcriptome atlas. There's a cancer transcriptome atlas, the encounter based readouts, the protein readouts. Those will be done by the eight global sites we've added. 
we haven't yet enabled those to hold the whole transcriptome atlas. And we really don't plan to ahead of the launch. We'll probably just keep that product run out of Seattle until its global availability as an assay that we can ship to customers. Okay, got it. Thank you again. Sure thing. And our next question comes from Tycho Peterson with J.P. Morgan. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, Brad, you previously talked about capacity to install 25 systems a quarter on Geomix. You did 35 this quarter. So can you maybe just talk to, uh, you know, what's led to the step up in installation capacity and, and where do you think that can go? Yeah, thanks for the question, Tyka. We've been um, investing and hiring additional support and field service engineers uh, in anticipation of growing demand for an order flow from Geomix. So for the last, um, I'd say for Q2 and Q3, our ability to recognize revenue on Geomix has been more limited by our customers' ability to accept the systems and invite our people in to install and train than it has been our own capacity uh, in terms of manpower to do that. Really, the, with COVID-19 and all the employee health and safety precautions around that, it's been less about our manpower and more about lab access. Uh, we, we, we are at a state now where um, I think we are, we are prepared to install geomic systems um, at whatever pace is required you know, to, to more or less match um, order flow and uh, revenue recognition. You know, so it, by, by, at least by the end of the fourth quarter, we will have kind of caught up and worked through most of our uh, backlog that we had accumulated uh, during 2019. We'll exit the, our guidance, implicit in our guidance is we'll exit the year with about 20 geomic systems and backlogs. So, you know, think of that as, you know, uh, puts us on a pace to basically install systems at the same pace that we accept orders next year. Um, so I, I don't think about that as a meaningful constraint anymore. We've we've made the hiring um, to to reduce that constraint or eliminate it rather. And then maybe um, you could provide us with some updated thoughts on the NGS readout, you know, scale up. You talked about ten orders this quarter and half of the you know technology access orders, you know, being tied to NGS readout. How, how quickly do you think you can kind of leverage Illumina's install base uh, and and scale that up? Well, I, I mean, I, I see that, you know, I would expect next year, uh, you think about 2021, I would expect the majority of our geomics orders to be coming from people who want to use NGS readout. That'll be true in 2021 and every year beyond. And that's simply based on, you know, the tremendous install base of Illumina systems that are already out there, the, um, the, inc the expanded capabilities, including the addition of proteins, as we announced this morning, to the NGS capability set. Um, and, of course, the addition of the whole transcriptome assay, which will be an incredibly exciting consumable launch next year. So I think demand, uh, while demand will remain robust for the in-counter readout, uh, most incremental growth will come on the NGS readout side. Um, and, you know, I, I, we really look forward to seeing what customers are able to do in terms of sample processing and pull-through using NGS readout. Um, as we've discussed many times in the past, the consumable pull-through potential of those customers is probably larger and more even more exciting than the in-counter readout customers. It's too early for us to declare you know, what a number is, but I'll say we were very pleased with Cancer Transcriptome Atlas orders that came in the third quarter. It was a pretty strong start from some of those first um, uh, customers. Another interesting phenomenon we'll see that we didn't talk about in our prepared remarks is many of our customers who acquire geomics initially for in-counter readout also have access to a sequencer in the same lab. Now that we've enabled NGS readout, many of those customers are asking us to come and train them on how to take advantage of the NGS readout. Even though they may use in-counter in some experiments, they want to be able to drive the higher plex on NGS readout and in others. And so I think that just it shows a strong demand for the cancer friendship on Atlas, even in the translational markets where our early installed base was. So I'm 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 very bullish overall on what the NGS readout is going to do for us, but it's hard for me to be very quantitative about that potential at this time. Okay, that's helpful. And then last one for me. I'm just curious if you can talk to you know use of proceeds from the recent offering. Um, you know, I think. There was a view when you did the convert back in March that you had what you needed. So I'm um, just curious if you could talk about what you're going to use the incremental cash for. Is it all for 
commercial scale up, or is there an eye to look externally, potentially do some M&A? Yeah, then, you know, the, the convertible debt financing that we did back in the spring really did provide enough capital for us to become, a, to grow into being a break-even company, which we've always said would occur at $200 million plus in product and service revenue. But what it didn't provide was incremental strategic capital to make investments in what we now feel is an enormous and underappreciated spatial biology opportunity. So we really think of this incremental capital as being put to work in three potential areas. The first is is commercial investment, uh, you know, capitalizing on on the momentum we have entering the discovery markets, for instance, by adding you know additional sales reps there or by finally choosing to go direct in major markets where we still work through distributors, such as in China and Japan, where we could probably do better if we went uh, direct on our own. So that's you know, cate- that's category one, commercial investment. Category two would be pipeline investments. Uh, yeah, we haven't yet revealed everything that we have uh, cooked up here organically, and we will talk more about that on December 1st, and I think people will be excited by some of the innovation that's con- to have here, happen here in a roadmap that moves beyond geomics, um, and we're excited to have the capital to fully um, uh, pursue those options. And then, of course, as the leader in spatial biology, you know, we do uh, track uh, a, a host of external innovations that are happening in companies large and small, and with, with the increased capital on our balance sheet, we're in a position to pursue those as strategic licenses or acquisitions or partnerships should uh, one of those technology platforms or products resonate strongly with us. And to be clear, you know, uh, and we were clear about this at the time that we did the financing, we're not in a hurry uh, to add inorganic growth, but um, but certainly we want to build on and extend our leadership position here in spatial biology, and we'll do that inorganically if, if the right opportunity arises. Okay, thank you. And our next question comes from Dan Brennan with UBS. Great, thanks. Uh, thanks for the questions, guys. Um, maybe Brad, just on the kind of the funnel, if you will, you talked about a torrid pace during the prepared remarks. Any any more color beyond you know kind of the number of customers in tap and they discuss publications? But what else would go into that torrid pace that might give us an insight towards kind of the opportunities we look out beyond 2020? Well, we've, we've continued, Dan, to have really great success with our virtual marketing approaches, both at major conferences like the recently completed ASHG, uh, some spatial biology conferences that we've really pulled together on our own, like one we held in September, and other small events that we've done both by ourselves and more recently in collaboration with Illumina. Um, just taking the Illumina example, you know, we've now held um, – about 10 events uh, with them jointly, generating about 1,500 marketing qualified leads. Those events have turned out to be really popular. Uh, they allow us to talk jointly about the unique capabilities that the geomics and uh, the sequencing lineup from Illumina bring. And we just, we just continue to have an unprecedented flow of new leads uh, into our organization that can be qualified and added to our sales funnel, and it grows every single week. Um, so we're, we're just, and, and I think, it, it, you know, as, as I said back in the springtime, while the pandemic has certainly slowed down, you know, the utilization of systems in people's labs, uh, our, our customers are, are still looking to the future, and spatial biology is on the top of a lot of people's shopping lists when they get back. And it's a capability they want to acquire and apply in their research going forward. So we have really... Um, uh, a lot of a lot of growth uh, every single week and month in our geomic sales funnel. Okay, and then and then maybe as we look ahead in terms of uh, the outlook in twenty one in terms of funding, can 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 you just discuss a little bit about where where the recent uh, new orders came from by customer type, and then as we think about twenty one from an academic funding standpoint. Any any sense about the prioritization or 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 not for spatial? Is that something that uh, any color you can give us on grants or or from a top down basis? How how maybe NIH is thinking about spatial as a potential funding opportunity? Yeah, I think 
So in terms of where our orders have been coming from recently, it's been more of the same, Dan. It's been largely cancer researchers uh, on either the translational side or the discovery side, because of, our, of course, our first discovery assay for NGS is a cancer transcriptome atlas. Um, it's probably been 60% academic, 40% biopharma and CRO, um, and um, you know, a good geographic split uh, that's representative of what our encounter business looks like. Um, so uh, in terms of the incremental demand next year, I think spatial is is going to be um, getting uh, you know more and more attention as a modality that um, people want to add to get incremental insights on top of their bulk or their single cell based ge genomics. I think it'll be things that editors are going to be or you know, peer reviewers are going to be looking for in papers. Um, I think the tremendous success that our early customers have had in getting high profile publications is going to be inspiring to a new wave of additional um, customers. So I, I feel really good about how spatial will be positioned as a 2021 investment area for anybody who's, um, you know, in, in biology. Look, I'm also encouraged by our president-elect, who is, um, you know, by far the most uh, connected uh, will be the most connected president uh, to the field of cancer that we've ever had, right? I mean, don't forget, Joe Biden, you know, started, lost his son to cancer, started a moonshot program, spent a tremendous amount of effort over the last several years on that field. And, uh, you know, while um, biological funding and science has always had bipartisan support, I think, you know, we could be coming up on a really, um, uh, a really positive era of investment in public health and science um, in the next several years. So I'm encouraged by that as well. And then, and then maybe just one more. I know it's too early to discuss kind of pull through on genomics and kind of where that can go to, but since you brought up some of the strength, I guess, on some of the CTA customers, is it possible just describe like maybe what a range of heavy users are, are kind of uh, using genomics in terms of a pull through or just anything that would give us a flavor about kind of, uh, you know, the range of outcomes that you're seeing? It's, it, there's too few of those customers to even give you a range, but I will say we had at least one six-figure order in terms of uh, cancer transcriptome atlas during the third quarter, uh, you know, a large study that was being initiated by one of our first customers to get access. And, if the, you know, that's a really good positive side about the scale of biology that people are thinking about uh, with this assay. I don't think, I would not represent that that's by any means typical but it does represent um, a good, enthusiastic early adopter and is encouraging. Great, thanks, Brad. Thanks, guys. And as a reminder to ask a question, that's star followed by the number one on your telephone keypad, star one. And our next question comes from Tejas Faven with Morgan Stanley. Uh, hey guys, good evening. Um, so Brad, uh, just one quick question for you on um, instrument installs this quarter. Um, obviously, you know, both Encounter and GeoMX look good. Um, can you just help us think through how much of this was a catch up in terms of, you know, orders which uh, you weren't able to ship in, in 2Q um, or, or was it just all, uh, you know, um, um, sort of organic demand and we should think of this as a, as a baseline number, if you will, going forward? Yeah, Tejas, um, I'll tell you, the, the Q3 instrument revenue was not a bunch of backlog shipping that had been accumulated during the second quarter. So, um, you know, we did, it, 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 um, it was, if your question is, did we receive a bunch of orders in Q2 that we failed to ship for a whole host of reasons and then recognize that in Q3, the answer is no. I'd say, you know, backlog entering and exiting the quarter was probably about the same. Uh, so what you're seeing in Q3 is current demand. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, it is the best measure we have of, uh, of what, you know, the current natural run rate for the business is in terms of instruments. Got it. That's helpful. And then, um, you know, just following up on your AMP comment, um, 
can you share some color, Brad, on how you think about the clinical opportunity for GeoMX uh, down the road? And, and, you know, to make it a little bit more specific, I mean, even with your launch of the protein assays uh, this morning, you highlighted sort of, you know, a use case in prostate cancer um, at the Hutch. Um, and, and so clearly, I mean, GeoMX would make, uh, you know, sense for those sorts of applications. But what remains to be done before the platform is ready for clinical prime time? Um, and when that time comes, um, should we expect you to partner with someone like you did for the encounter, or uh, will you go after that segment yourself? Just, it's very early days in knowing exactly where geomics will fit in the clinical diagnostic realm or whether we'll choose to go alone or partner. Um, what we're doing today is really focused on allowing some of our translational customers to do what they do, to translate their early protein-based assays into clinical assays and to build the case for why that would be more useful than traditional methods like immunohistochemistry. The most obvious use case of geomics would be to allow um, a pathologist to run a large number of immunohistochemistry assays that they would normally either run sequentially on different slices or because they were tissue limited would not run at all um, in a single, they run all those in a single assay. Um, and I think that'll be the first area that we see our uh, diagnostic users try. And I run a, a you know, a, a making it up, a 10-plex immunohistochemistry assay in the clinic. That's the most obvious thing. But there are also potential for novel assays. Some of the first uh, papers that came out on genomics, for instance, in the field of immuno-oncology showed that incremental predictive benefit could come from knowing exactly what cell type certain biomarkers were expressed on. So, for instance, David Rim from Yale showed pdl one expression on macrophages was more predictive than pdl one expression overall in terms of who responded to certain immunotherapies. So there's a, there's a possibility for novel assays to come out as well. And, you know, I expect the next several years as we build our install base and academic medical centers and biopharmaceutical companies for there to be a whole host of innovation and discovery about diagnostic content. And, you know, we'll start by working with those centers to, um, uh, to, to, disturb, to, to try to develop rather a, um, a, a laboratory developed test. And then we'll take our strategy from there, whether we want to ever have an in vitro diagnostic version of the system uh, and what role we would play in that remains to be seen. Got it. That's helpful. Um, and then apologies if I missed this earlier, but could you just give us a quick update on your informatics collaboration with Illumina? Um, is that um, in early access now or is that still ahead of you? Um, and, and if it's already out in early access, any uh, feedback from customers who are using Dragon for spatial biology? Yeah, that that, uh, that partnership continues to go well. Um, I believe it's going to be going into early access in the weeks and months ahead, um, uh, you know, and we'll have more to say on that, you know, as we move through Q4. Uh, so it's a little too early for me to give you actual customer feedback on that, Tejas, but uh, in terms of the collaboration between the two companies and our confidence that this is going to help create um, a streamlined workflow, uh, you know, we continue to feel enthusiastic. Got it. Thanks so much, Brad. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. There should be uh, the replay will be up on our website in the next couple hours. In the meantime, uh, if you want to dial in for a replay, if you missed any part of the call, uh, domestic dialers can dial 800-585-8367. International callers, please dial 416-621-4642. The conference ID for both is the same, 517 517- Two one two eight. With that, thank you very much for your time and have a great day. Goodbye. And that does conclude today's conference call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect.